presence because of all the Lord Jesus has done. And so, Lord, we just pray your blessing on this time this morning, and it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your mouth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us here today at Forge Road Bible Chapel. If you read ahead in this, our fourth week in the Hebrews series, and perhaps you took a peek at the chapel's monthly bulletin to figure out which passages we will be studying, then you already know that we are studying Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and we will be reading from there and proceeding on through chapter 5, and verse 10 to start. We will also be dipping into the end of chapter 7 later this hour for reasons to be explained then. The last time I had the privilege to speak from this platform, I was assigned two parables, which totaled just over 60 words. I remember being panicked at the beginning of that process that I wouldn't have enough material to fill the whole hour, a fear that turned out to be a really silly one. And after being assigned this passage late in 2022, I remember feeling the opposite as I did the time prior. There might be too much, and I don't know how I'm going to cut it all down to fit in. But in my research, I came across a sermon from Charles Spurgeon, who spoke 123 years ago on some of the same texts that we will read today. And he boiled down the core message of this text so nicely that I thought I would share. My thoughts this morning reflect his his introduction to that sermon when he said, happy is the man who has such a message as that in this text to deliver to his fellow men. But burdened is the man who feels that the message is far too great for his lips, or indeed, for any human tongue to convey, to be allowed to announce to men that our Lord Jesus Christ offered up himself on their behalf is indeed an errand which angels might envy, but the theme is too great for any human being to compass. I comfort myself with the reflection that it does not require any excellence of speech to tell it. The excellence lies in the truth itself. If men's minds are in a right condition, if they are conscious of their lost state and they really desire to know what Christ has done to save them from it, They will want no garnishing or tawdry fripperies of human eloquence. All they will want will be to hear, as plainly and as earnestly as it can be spoken, the message of reconciliation which God has sent through Christ Jesus, his son. Let's pray together before we go into the Lord's word. God, thank you for yet another opportunity for us to gather here in your name. Guide the words I say and settle our hearts so that we are all ready to hear what you have for us. Put our minds in the right condition as well. Be our teacher and be our lesson. To you be all the glory and honor in your name. Amen. Now I invite you to turn with me, if you haven't already, to Hebrews 4.14. Now I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does of those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, 
Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another, in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. May the Lord bless, giving us a good understanding of his word today. So to understand the words that we have just read, it is necessary to know why the speaker is so preoccupied by priests and Jesus' priesthood. The concept of Jesus' priesthood is absolutely fundamental to a good understanding of Christianity. The speaker in this passage is elucidating a concept to a world which, like today, uh, was filled with people who had yet to hear it. Although it is likely that the speaker in Hebrews delivered the words outside of Jerusalem, it is important to note at the outset here that the speaker is talking to a group of recently converted Christians of a Hebrew background who would have been intimately familiar with the office of priest as it was laid out in the Old Testament. We also know that these Hebrews were facing persecution for their recent conversion, persecution which is alluded to in chapter 10. It was probably enormously tempting, uh, given this persecution, for these Hebrews to return to Jerusalem, the temple, and the religion of their fathers. There, they could have gone and seen the high priest ministering at the altar. They could have returned to something familiar, comfortable, and orthodox for the time. But what is this priesthood? What was it in the Old Testament, and how come it matters now? Before Christ came to earth and offered himself as the permanent sacrifice for all sins, for all men, for all time, the Israelites had to offer animal sacrifices for their sins according to the law that God gave them through Moses, as recorded in books like Leviticus. The Israelites were not allowed to offer sacrifices themselves in places of their own choice. They needed to do it either at the tabernacle of Moses or in the temple of Jerusalem where the Lord's glory, the Bible tells us, resided. And they needed to offer these sacrifices in the presence of priests whose job it was to officiate such offerings according to the rules in God's law. It was their job to act as a mediator between the sinful humans and their perfect God, whose law the people had broken. The high priest was a distinct office above those of normal priests, if you will, which God also established in his law. The first high priest was Aaron, Moses' brother, and God commanded the high priesthood to be passed down through his line. In addition to officiating over ordinary sacrifices and overseeing the responsibilities of the lower priests being taken care of, the high priest had one especially solemn duty. Once a year, on the Day of, the of Atonement, also known today as Yom Kippur, the high priest, and only the high priest, would enter the Holy of Holies, the innermost and most sacred room in the Tabernacle of Moses and Temple of Jerusalem, which housed the Ark of the Covenant. This was a room that was cut off from all others. As a mark of exclusion to others, there was a, at the entrance a sort of do not enter sign. It was a large, heavy linen drape known as the veil, which was made up of the finest materials in the finest colors of the day. And on the Day of Atonement, God would appear in the Holy of Holies, hence the need for the veil, because there needed to be separation from man and God. God could not be in the presence of sin. He would appear at the top of the ark in what was known as the mercy seat. The high priest, before entering, would need to go through elaborate rituals to cleanse himself uh, before entering the presence of God. Once in the windowless enclosure that was the Holy of Holies, the high priest had to bring burning incense so that the smoke would cover his eyes from a direct view of God. Once in his presence also, he would bring to the mercy seat of the ark sacrificial blood taken from a spotless lamb to atone for his own sins and for the sins of the people. Now this sacrificial system was handed down by God and given to his covenant people as a gift. Israel did not invent it themselves, but it did teach them three timeless lessons 
which are still relevant today. One, forgiveness from sin is possible. Two, the punishment for sin is death. And three, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. The sacrificial system was never forward-looking. It was always backward-looking. It could only atone for sins against God that had already passed and offered what would, of course, be a temporary redemption. So after sacrifices were made and forgiveness was granted, and after everyone went home again, the Lord's law would inevitably continue to be broken, which meant that the Israelites were once again in the hole and had to make another trip to the temple to make amends with the Lord through yet another blood sacrifice. But always and everywhere, this sacrificial system pointed to a greater fulfillment to come, a perfect human sacrifice who could serve as the mediator between God and man forever. Someone who, as Spurgeon put it, would be able to come to God so near that God should call him his fellow, and then he must be able to approach to man so closely he shall not be ashamed to call him brother. And so the speaker in Hebrews makes it his aim to explain the great high priesthood of Jesus Christ. For if Jesus is the great high priest that the speaker in Hebrews says he was, then the continuance of giving burnt offerings for sins, or even the continuance of the, offer, of the office of high priest, is a folly. This is the central theme of Hebrews. The word priest, or its plural priests, appear 35 times in the book of Hebrews. It's appeared just two times in the chapters that we've already studied before in this series. And by the time we're done today, we will have read it just seven times this hour. The speaker's been warming up in the first few chapters, but now he's at the heart of his main message. He begins in verse 14, noting that Jesus is the Son of God and that he has passed through the heavens before urging his listeners to hold fast to their confession of this fact. This certainly speaks to those in the crowd who as they were perhaps looking longingly back at the temple of Jerusalem in their minds, needed the reminder that their eternal Savior had already come. This is the speaker's sort of thesis statement for the section of text that we are reading. This is his main point. Our Savior has come. He is a great high priest, fundamentally different from all the other high priests that have come before. So hold fast to this confession and don't turn around. He goes on to talk about how Jesus can sympathize with our every weakness. Our Savior can sympathize with us as we go through our days and darts of temptation which try to turn us away from following the Lord are thrown at us from all directions. He too was tempted, yet without sin. More on that later. In the first few verses of chapter 5, the speaker goes through the characteristics and requirements of high priests in the Old Testament. We'll go through them just quickly here and return later. A priest would, first of all, need to be chosen from among men. That seems plain enough. Secondly, he would need to be able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he also is an ignorant and wayward soul who is beset by weakness. Third, He would need to offer sacrifices for his own sins and for those of the people because of the aforementioned ignorance and waywardness. Finally, he would need to be called by God to be a high priest since no one takes this honor for himself. Now I'd like to pause on these thoughts for a moment if you will allow me to take a short digression. Last year, my beloved Baltimore Orioles had a wonderful season. You probably remember it. They weren't supposed to have a good season. Before it started, the baseball writers at ESPN projected that the Orioles would once again be the worst team in baseball and win 58 games and lose 104. If absolutely everything went right, the baseball writers at ESPN said, the Orioles maybe, just maybe, could win 70 of their 162 games. Of course they were wrong. On opening day 2022, the Orioles catcher was this was Robinson Chirinos, a veteran ball player and by all accounts a great teammate. But for all the leadership skills that Robinson Chirinos reportedly had in the clubhouse, he lacked the on-field production to make him a mainstay in the starting lineup. From the beginning of the season, his days as the presumed starter were numbered, and every baseball fan in Baltimore knew it. There was a new catcher. Coming up from the minor leagues, a young, highly skilled, much anticipated number one 
overall pick in the players draft from a few years prior. The Orioles reward for being the worst team, Adley Rutschman. He's said to be the first in a long string of players who, if all goes well, could perhaps bring a World Series championship back to Baltimore for the first time in at least 40 years. The Orioles started out last year about as they were expected to. They were 16 and 24, dead last in their division. To that point, through 40 games, they had won just 40% of those games, and that's not good. But on game 41 of the season, at the end of May, Adley Rutschman made his debut, and he made an immediate impact on the clubhouse and on the field. From his debut on, the Orioles won 55% of their remaining 122 games, finishing with their first winning season in six years while narrowly missing the postseason. And I doubt that there has ever been a team or a fan base happier with a fourth place finish in all of baseball history. But when you account for all their intents and all of their purposes, Robinson Chirinos and Adley Rutschman are the same. They both play catcher for the Baltimore Orioles. They both seek to throw runners out stealing second base, and they each tried their best to get hits and score runs. They dress in the same locker room. They wear the same uniform. They go to the ballpark each day with the sole purpose of trying to help the Orioles win. One is younger and better right now, but with time, Adley will get hurt just like Chirinos has. He will go on the injured list. He will go through hitting slumps where pitchers are so successful at striking him out that they feel like they could do so by throwing a beach ball 50 miles an hour over the plate rather than a baseball at 95. And with time, Adley will probably find himself in Chirinos' shoes. His newness will wear off. His knees will not be so sprightly. If all goes absolutely perfectly, Adley can count on spending another 15 years in the major leagues before retiring around age 40 and riding off into the sunset, perhaps with a World Series ring or two and enough money to live comfortably for the rest of his life. You might be thinking, I like the Orioles too, Nate. But what has all this got to do with Hebrews and the great high priest in any way? I don't care about the Orioles. Why should I care? Allow me to answer that question this way. What Adley Rutschman is to Robinson Chirinos is not what Jesus is to the high priests of old. So let me say that again another way. What this news, new Orioles catcher is to the departing one is not what Jesus, our great high priest, is to the old line of high priests. Adley Rushman is just better than Robinson Chirinos is, but even Adley will fade away in time, just as each of the high priests of the Old Testament died and faded into history. In contrast to this, Jesus is not merely better than the high priests of old. He is different from them, and he will never fade away. This is what the speaker in Hebrews wants to get across in the verses we will read in a moment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is our final high priest, and he's so high that the, speakers in he the speaker in Hebrews calls him the great high priest. No one of the Old Testament priests ever had that title. Jesus is not just better, he's different. And so are we because of him. In accepting him, we are his new creation, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. To further demonstrate how Jesus is different and not just merely better, let's look together now at chapter 7 and verses 26 through 28. Now, this may appear to be against the rules because, after all, the monthly bulletin did not mention that these verses would be read this week. And furthermore, Mark Francis will be talking about chapter 7 in just two weeks. But I promise this is no trespass. Mark gave me permission to meander into his assigned text. But more impor importantly, and I want everyone to know that this is a true story, Tom Shetlick uh, told me that if I didn't talk about the end of chapter 7, he would take it upon himself to walk out back and let all the air out of my tires before I could leave this afternoon. <laughs> wow. Tom, I didn't know that this is a common tactic, tactic at Ferguson, Shetlick, and Ballou. <laughs> um, but it worked. <laughs> so I decided to include it. In all seriousness, though, 
in looking to these verses, it is good to remember what Sean Williams pointed out in the first week of, his, of this series. Hebrews is a speech. If you've noticed, I've kept on saying speaker this morning in reference to he who delivered the words recorded in Hebrews instead of saying writer. And in the course of speeches, as you know, people have a tendency to meander and go on tangents in order to make points that are not necessarily clear at the time they are made, much like the Orioles one I took a few minutes ago. So in between chapter 5, verse 10, and the verses we are about to read, the speaker has gone on a tangent which we will hear all about when Tom and Mark speak about them in the next few weeks. But just a short while later in the book, the speaker returns to the main point about Jesus' priesthood, his great high priesthood. So let's read together. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. In this passage, we see the characteristics of Christ which made him a great high priest and distinct from the high priests of old. You might notice how each of these characteristics contrast with those characteristics which were laid out in chapter 5 that were required of Old Testament priests. So let's go through these together and compare. The speaker makes four observations. The first of these is that whereas the old high priests were chosen from among men, our great high priest is the Son of God. This great high priest, we are told, is holy, innocent, untainted, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. None of those attributes could be purely attributed to Old Testament priests. The Old Testament priests were set apart for their ministry, so in that sense they were holy, but they were not always holy in character, as evidenced by their needing to offer sacrifices for their own sins. But Jesus' perfect righteousness gave him unchallenged rights to God's presence. The fact that Jesus is innocent, untainted, separated from sinners, and exalted from above the heavens does not mean he is unapproachable to us, though. Separated from sinners does not mean isolated. The evidence to the contrary is abundant in the Bible. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, an intimate friend of people like you and I. And that is extraordinary. Most kings were not approachable in Bible times, not even now. Not so with our king of kings. Prominent people in public life like to make themselves exclusive. Perhaps some of them have an inflated perception of their own self-importance, and if you ran into them on the street and excitedly tried to introduce yourself, they may brush you off and walk quickly on by. Sometimes it is just in the air of a place where people can catch that sickness. The company at which I work is a networking organization for law students, practicing lawyers, law professors, judges, and anyone in between. One of my duties is to put on networking events, uh, where, like lunches, for interested members of our organization to come, have some lunch, and meet each other. Sometimes they make important business connections at our meetings. And sometimes, and this is especially potent the closer you get to Capitol Hill in my experience, I find myself at these events in conversation with some congressional staffer who works in an office that I find interesting, or a, with a lawyer who works at a firm that I want to learn more about, and all of a sudden I notice that they aren't paying any attention to the conversation we're having. Instead, they're scanning the room, looking for someone else besides me who's more important and more they'd rather talk to. This is a well-known practice at DC events, but so far as I can tell, it doesn't have a name, so I just call it off-putting. <laughs> You'll remember in the book of Esther, where the book's namesake came before her husband, King Ahasuerus, but she did so unannounced. When she did this, it wasn't lost upon her that doing so would put her life at stake. The same unapproachableness was part and parcel of the attitudes of, and of the great philosophers and religious leaders of Jesus' day. Though he was not a contemporary of Jesus, it is fa said that Plato famously wrote on the door to his research institute, let no one who is ignorant of geometry enter. That would bar my entrance. <laughs> this hubris and pretentiousness is not a trait of the king of kings and the great high priest. 
he is approachable. Though he sits exalted in the heavens next to the right hand of the Father, he invites us to join freely in a relationship with him. Our God is a God who wants communion with us. He wants a relationship. There are now no barriers to talk with our king. You don't need to go through elaborate rituals to talk with him either. No amount of travel can get us closer because he's accessible wherever we go. And there's no being put on hold and waiting in line to talk to he who can help you when, as Hebrews 4.16 says, we are in time of need. Our God is one who desires an intimate relationship with us. So approach him, approach him boldly and with great confidence. The second point made by the speaker is that the old high priests were beset by weakness. Our great high priest is the son of God who has been made perfect forever. No longer do we need to have a human priest chosen from among us who needs to offer gifts and sacrifices on our behalf and for his own self because of our weakness which we succumb to when we sin. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice and he offered up himself in place of us sinners. He took on death for all people and for all time. Now Hebrews notes that Jesus was tested. He knew the voice of temptation, as chapter 4 verse 15 tells us, and he was familiar with not wanting to obey the will of his father. As Hebrews 5 8 says, he learned obedience through what he suffered. The chief example of Jesus' obedience being tested is recorded in Matthew chapter 26 for us. He, Jesus knows that, that the time has almost come for him to be put to death. And he tells his disciples that his soul is very sorrowful. He knows that he must go through what the Lord has sent him there to do, but he, he's down on his knees pleading with the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And of course, you know the story. Shortly after this prayer, he's betrayed, and he is arrested, and he carries his own cross before he's nailed to it. At any point, he could have cried out for the angels of heaven, the very ones who announced and celebrated his birth, to come save him from the acute pain and suffering and humiliation imposed on him by the Romans. But he doesn't. He obeyed. He let his father's will be fulfilled. So beset by weakness, not this high priest. Thirdly, the old high priests were appointed through the line of Aaron. Our great high priest was appointed by the oath of God and will reign forever. Chapter 5, verse 4 mentions that no one took the honor of the priesthood for himself, but only when they were called by God as Aaron was. Jesus was called by God, but his priesthood is fundamentally different because it will not end. He is the permanent mediator between us and the Father who we have sinned against. JP read Psalm 110 for us earlier. In that psalm, God made an oath, an oath which is mentioned in chapter 7, verse 28. The oath was given to David later than the law was given to Moses, another fact mentioned in verse 28. The Lord, in between the time when he sent his law to Moses and when he sent his son to the earth, made an oath as it is recorded by David in Psalms. He made an oath about something which he would not change his mind about. In verse 1 of Psalm 10, we establish who is speaking to whom in these verses. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now the first use of Lord is without a doubt reference to the Father God, since the Hebrew term used is Yahweh. The second refers to Jesus, whom God commands to sit at his right hand in glory, the same place as Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that Jesus is currently sitting. Skipping down to verse 4 in this psalm, we get this powerful line, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, meaning Jesus, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the oath. This is the promise from God that his son is coming, a perfect, great high priest whose reign will never end. The high priest of old would pass away, but not this one. The Lord had sworn an oath about this, and he did not change his mind. And finally, the fourth point. The text tells us that the old high priest needed to offer sacrifices for sin, both their own and those who came to him. But our great priest, and great high priest, in contrast, 
died one time for all time. He is the answer to our pleas for, del for deliverance from sin and death. There was never a better sacrifice on earth. There was never a more spotless lamb, yet the only person who could truly offer that sacrifice was Christ himself. And therein lies the great announcement at the end of chapter 7. God offered up himself for all people, for all sin, and for all time. He was not forced to die. No one could have killed him without his acquiescence. But bearing shame and scoffing rude in our place, condemned he stood and he sealed our pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. In making all of these distinctions between Jesus and the old high priest, the speaker's point is that Jesus is not merely a better high priest, but that he represents something completely new. This is no changing of the high priestly guard. This is not a transfer of power as the high priest from Aaron's line passed away and a new one was appointed by God. This was the king of kings sending down his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to offer up himself as a permanent intercession on our behalf. As JP read in Psalm 110 earlier, the Lord had sworn and he would not change his mind. Likewise, for us, there is no need to turn around. The blood of the Holy Lamb has been spilled in our stead. Jesus Christ has come, and he is our substitute. He gave up himself, so run to him, because forgiveness is possible. And once you do, hold fast to your confession. Run to the Father. Trust in him, and jump off the high diving platform, and fall into his grace because you and I have a rendezvous with judgment. None of us can know the hour, but one day God will be in front of us. At his right hand, exalted above the heavens, will be our great high priest. Through him, all of us, not just those who were chosen as priests, have been invited to a throne of mercy. Hebrews 5.9 tells us that our source of eternal sal he is our source to eternal salvation to all who obey him. I invite you to join me as I have accepted that invitation and hold fast to my confession that Jesus is Lord because he bore my sin with his body on the tree so that when I go to that throne, fall on my knees and offer up my cries for mercy, the great high priest will turn to his left and say, gracious father, this man has come to plead my sacrifice on Calvary. And he has come to receive mercy. And as God ordained, that plea will be enough. I will need no other sacrifice. I'll need no other argument. I will need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Thank you for your attention this morning. Next week, we will continue in this series in Hebrews and hear from Tom Shetlick. I look forward to that. And I invite you to join us here next week to listen. Let's pray and I'll hand it back to Brian. Lord, we can never thank you enough for offering yourself. Thank you for interceding for us and being a great high priest. We recognize that we are hopeless in eternity without you. As we leave this week, give us an ever-growing desire to know you more because there is no greater thing than that. Bless Tom as he prepares to speak next week, and bless the remainder of the speakers in this series as well. In your name, amen.